And today we have Chris. And uh, Chris has been here a year now. Came here from UBC. And he's been working on my rejected paper. <laughs> it's, it's a really good work. And we had many people said it was good work, but only two out of three reviewers or something like that. <laughs> okay. So let's let's keep going. So I'm Chris Theosis, I'm a relatively new master student here with Mother Rich. And this is a talk on Q signal lambda, which is an algorithm that I've been working on and playing around with. And it's called the dimensions of bootstrapping because I will try and show that sigma has a close relationship with lambda in this case. So to give an overview of what I'll be talking about, I will be summarizing temporal difference learning, then I will give an overview of the landscape of n step TD algorithms, then I will unify the space algorithms with the n step Q sigma algorithm. Then I will talk about TD lambda algorithms, which are characterized by performing compound backups. And I will talk about the compound backup version of Q sigma, Q -sigma lambda. So to summarize TD learning, it's, it's done in a reinforcement learning environment, and that can be described in this diagram, where you've got some agent, and it will select some action according to a policy. That action will be fed into the environment. The environment will produce the agent's next state and give it a reward signal. And then the agent can use this reward signal to try and update its behavior policy, and in this new state, it will try and it will then select a new action and continue the cycle. And in particular, the agent is trying to learn about a return, which is a cumulative discounted reward sequence, and with discount factor gamma as defined here. And with temporal difference learning methods, the agent is trying to learn value functions. And in particular, there are two value functions. One of them is the state value function which is denoted as V of S, and it's the expected return under a policy pi given the state S. And there's the action value function, which is denoted as Q, which is the expected return under policy pi given a state and an action. Now, the way TD learning works is through these update rules, and something very characteristic to TD learning is that it's bootstrapping. Instead of using some sequence of rewards, it'll use some rewards, and then just use its estimate, um, use its current estimates in the value function, because the value function is defined to be this expected return. So it'll sample some rewards and try and guess the rest of the return by using its current estimates in the value function. And highlighted in red are the TD targets, which it's trying to update its values towards. And it takes the difference between its current estimate and takes a step in that direction with step size alpha. And in the action value case, this is called SARSA, and the updated equations look very similar. Now this can be generalized into a multi-step way. Um, in one step starts so you take one action, you receive one reward, and then you start bootstrapping off of your next sampled action. In a two step starts so you take two actions, you, you receive two rewards, you add them up, and then you bootstrap off of your third sampled action, and so on. And these targets can be nicely visualized through these backup diagrams, where a black dot represents an action, a white circle represents a state. And so you have some initial state action pair, you receive some reward, you end up in a new state, and you, you commit to another action. and then. Once the backup diagram stops, you start to perform your TD update, you bootstrap from that point onwards and update your values. So two steps are sort of like that, where you take an extra action, you're in a new state, and then you commit to a third action, and then you start bootstrapping. And then there's three steps are so. And if you go all the way until you terminate the episode and you just use the full sequence of returns with no bootstrapping, you end up with a Monte Carlo method. And TD algorithms correspond to everything up to, but not including the Monte Carlo approach. So to give an overview of the landscape of n step TD algorithms, you've seen one step stars already, where your target or your estimate of the return is the like sample reward plus the action value of the, net, of the next action sample from your policy. But another algorithm for doing this is expected stars up, where instead of sampling the next action and bootstrapping off of the action value of that sampled action, you just take an expectation under your policy across all actions you have in that new state. And then there's also this popular algorithm called Q-learning, but, but the way Q-learning works is it takes a maximum of your Q values in that new state, but if you look at expected SARSA, if your policy pi is greedy with respect to your value function, then it's just identical to performing this max operation, and so key learning is just a special case of expected SARSA. And so in the landscape, it might look something like this. We've got one-step SARSA, multi-step SARSA, one-step expected SARSA, 
And arguably, the multi-step extensions expect in SARSA is true backup, where you take an expectation at each step. Now, this can all be unified with the n-step q-sigma algorithm. And in the one-step case here, you've got a mixture of one-step SARSA and one-step expected SARSA, where the proportions are controlled by this parameter sigma. And sigma ranges between 0 and 1. And when you add them together, you get this mixture called one-step q-sigma. Again, this holds in the NSEP case where you take a mixture between NSEP SARSA and NSEP tree backup. But like this visualization kind of implies that sigma is constant, but it does not need to be. Like in, as shown in this diagram, in the first step, sigma is 1, you just sample your action for your policy. In the next step, sigma is 0.5, where you use a mixture of sampling and taking an expectation. And in the last step, sigma equals 0, where you, only, you just take an expectation. It doesn't matter what action you sample from your policy. And on the right, we've got a scale of full sampling and no sampling, where you go from 1 to 0. And this is sort of what it looks like. This is an epsilon greedy policy with three actions. The middle action is the greedy action. And the bars represent the weight that's being given to each action value at the time of each sample. And as you like, decrease sigma, it starts to look like this, where you start to assign some like, stationary value to each action, plus some smaller, weight, uh, some smaller weighted sample. And as you get to zero, you just start to weight all your action values with your policy directly instead of having any sampling. And yeah, so here are some results with the NSTEP Q-Sigma algorithm done on the 19 safe random walk task. And this is plotting the RMS error in the value function. And this shows that not only is there, like not only does this algorithm unify the landscape of NSTEP algorithms, but it also shows that there might be a reason why you'd want to do this, like that the unification is a good thing because if you look at the different values of sigma, it's performing better at different times. And if you vary sigma dynamically, it's possible to outperform any fixed value of sigma. Um, what is n, or is, does n change, or is it fixed? Um, I think in this case, n was 3. Okay. Yeah. And it just happened to be the best across the parameter sigma we did for each value of sigma. So you're going slowly, you're queuing slowly, but you're going slowly. Yeah. But in the limit, it ends up with the least amount. Zero means you're it's expected. Yeah, it's all expectations. It's three true backup. It's kind of surprising that that's slow. Well, later on in the talk, there'll be some intuition as to why that's happening. And so I'll be moving on to compound backups. These are under the TD Lambda class of algorithms, where it, it can be seen as taking a weighted average of several n step backups, as opposed to just specifying n, taking n actions, and then backing that up. And they're weighted by this scheme over here, where if a one step backup has a weight of 1 minus lambda, and then as you increase n, you can multiply things by a backup of lambda, where lambda is between 0 and 1. So this is slowly decaying as you increase the length of the backup. And if you, were, if you were to weight the length of each backup by these weightings, you would find that it has an effective length of 1 over 1 minus lambda. And what you can take away from that is that as you increase lambda, the effective length of this backup will increase. And so lambda can sort of be interpreted as the effective length of the backup or the length parameter. And it's also um, referred to as the degree of bootstrapping because like, as the length increases, it's as if you're including more rewards in your sequence before you start bootstrapping. Now I'm going to back up and revisit tree backup, and this is in the end step piece again. On the left, I have two step tree backup. On the right, I sort of sliced it to try and get a feel of what's going on here. And I've denoted the actions as left, middle, and right as L, M, and R. If, if you look at the side branches at the top there, it's it's pretty straightforward, where you just take the probability of taking that action multiplied by the action value associated with it. But as you go down that middle branch, you've got the probability of taking that middle action multiplied by another expectation. So as you can see, as you go down this middle branch, you end up with this big product of probabilities of, of the actions that you take. And what that does is effectively introduce some discounting into the, into the mix, even in addition to gamma. And what this also does is, because as you notice, like the middle path is where all the rewards are, are received. This effectively gives less weight to the rewards you're receiving and tries to compensate by including these side branches. And so, because it's giving less weight to the actual reward sequence you're receiving, it can be seen that tree backup is more biased than SARSA. Because SARSA will give equal weight to every single reward you receive and then just average that out. And another cool thing is that with this backup diagram on the left, 
with G backup, it can be shown that this can be decomposed in a, into the weighted sum of these backups, weighted by the probability of each trajectory. And if, if I were to ignore the fact that each of these backups are bootstrapping off into a different value, and just add up the weights of each backup with a certain length, in the end step case, you get something like this. And it, like you can see that like, a lot of them have this term where it's the sum of the probabilities of the actions you didn't take. And you can also see that that's equivalent to 1 minus the probability of the action you did take. And it'll look something like this. Now, this looks kind of familiar. This is, like, you can see that tree backup is like a special case of SARSA lambda, where you have, where you have action dependent lambda. And yeah, so it looks pretty close to this, where you've got like a 1 minus pi term, and then as you increase the length, you keep multiplying by another pi. So like n-step tree backup in itself is doing a compound backup. Right? But another takeaway from this is that its effective length is 1 minus c to the n over 1 minus c. And this is in expectation under the epsilon greedy policy, where c is a policy dependent constant that is between 0 and 1. And the main takeaway from this is that this is less than n. So if you do a like, 3-step tree backup and 3-step SARSA, SARSA has a length of 3, tree backup might have a length of 2 and a half. So even though you're taking three actions, you're not backing up as much as SARSA would be. Okay. What's n name? The number of actions you have. Okay, sure. And I'm assuming that it's constant for each state. Yeah, so going back to compound backups, this is SARSA lambda, and you've got tree backup lambda, which is sort of taking a compound backup, both compound backups in a different direction. And this has an effective length of 1 minus c lambda, where c is the same constant from before. And so one thing you can compare with um, stars of lambda, this is like this has a decay rate of lambda as you increase the length, but this sort of effectively has a decay rate of c lambda. So the lengths of the backups and tree backup decay is a lot faster than in stars of lambda. And also you can see that lambda can be greater than one in the tree backup case because of this. Now, as you probably get, can guess, like Q sigma lambda is some mixture of stars of lambda and tree backup lambda. Like the effective length is kind of shaky because I found different ways of implementing this with varying performance. And one way of doing it is to just perform SARSA lambda, perform tree backup lambda, and take some mixture of these compound backups. And you get something like the first effective length there, where you're just waiting with the two lengths. But if you acknowledge that you have two things decaying at different rates, and instead of averaging these two things decaying at different rates, I would have some mixture of that decay rate, and, and then mix, mix the TD target separately, and then combine the two at the end. And I tested both of these. They're equivalent at sigma equals 0 and sigma equals 1. But what happens in between is very different. So I'm just showing this for sigma equals 0.75 because I don't have space to show you the full sigma lambda space. But on top is where I just mix stars of lambda and three back of lambda, which are decaying at different rates. And the first observation is that like, the error starts to explode, especially for the longer backup lengths with, with high lambda. Like, as you increase alpha, things just start to blow up. But in the second case where I'm mixing the decay rates and mixing the TD targets separately, things are relatively more stable. And it, so, it just so happened that the lowest error of this approach is lower than the lowest error of the other approach. Now, I don't really have a justification as to which one is the right way of doing this, but empirically, this is doing a lot better. Now, some other takeaways. Lambda is sometimes referred to as the degree of bootstrapping, and sigma has this interpretation as a degree of sampling. But true backup in itself is a compound backup involving bootstrapping in the direction of actions not taken. And by controlling the proportion of true backup, sigma can also be seen as another degree of bootstrapping, but in a different direction from the lambda. Like lambda is concerned with the actions you did take, and sigma is concerned with the actions you didn't take. And yeah, so that's mostly the Q-sigma lambda algorithm. And like going back to those effective lengths that I kept showing, like, another cool thing about this is, like, in the one step case, like, one step SARSA and one step expected SARSA have the exact same effective length. They both have length of one. And when you, this, these are again plots on the random mock task. Like, as you can see, they're empirically equivalent at small alpha, and then as you get to higher alpha, lower sigma ends up winning, and it seems strictly better than any of the other cases. But, like, eight step SARSA and eight step tree backup have different lengths. and like, as you can see, at lower alpha, they're no longer equivalent. And you still have a, a, a sort of similar trend where low, low sigma will win in the end, but like, there's that discrepancy in the, starting, in the starting positions 
compared to one step star set and one space time star set. So like, let's say I take this set of single lambda pairs, which seem fairly random, but they all of them have an effective length of eight. And when I test all of these together, they end up with the same trend as the one step star set and one step um, expected star set case, where they have an effective length of one. And as you can see, they're all empirically equivalent at low alpha. And as you increase alpha, the lower sigma ends up winning and seems strictly better than everything else, as long as you match the effective lengths. So there seems to be something here, but I, I don't have too much intuition or insight into why this is important, but this is probably my next step. And yeah, thank you. That was really efficient. <laughs> <laughs> we have lots of time for questions. Steps. Yeah. Um, but, uh, okay, that like in your experiment, you set the the sigma uh, for a sigma value for like in, in, the, in a trajectory or something like that. So, is there any like uh, advantage that uh, a different sigma value for a different time step can bring? Um, yes. Like I have a plot here of, of the Q sigma algorithm in the random walk test and. Yeah. This curve that goes along the outside is the dynamic signal where it's decaying after each episode. Okay. And oh, yes, it's the dynamic. Yeah, so it's like at, at the start you can see that star set performs better, which is yeah. sigma equals one, and then in the limit, like sigma equals zero, or tree back, tree back performs the best. So if you start with one and then slowly decay towards zero, you sort of go along the outside of all of those curves and then they're probably better than all of the uh, since it's the dynamic sigma sigma is just means the sigma is decaying as the like time yeah, step. Yeah, like we just chose a fixed decay rate and it will decay after each episode. So it's kind of like take the advantage of both SARSA and the tree steps. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let me see if I understand. So you end up saying that the reason Q0 is slow is because it's doing uh, more has more bias. Yes. Because um, I don't know. This is Q this is sigma zero, right? Mm -hmm. So that is we're doing kind of like N three step back of C and um, zero is doing expectations at each level. Yes. And it's slower because it's it's, it's more biased by the initial value of uh, the initial action value estimates. Yeah, it's doing more bootstrapping and giving less weight to the actual reward sequence. Whereas Q1, um, which is SARSA, it's only influenced by the third ahead uh, action value, although it has more real rewards in it. Yeah. And it looks like generally the initial learning rate is sort of monotonic. The final rates are reversed. Yeah, once your values start getting better, you just start to be biased in the right direction and your back up and so Have you seen this pattern on, on other tasks? I think you've tried other tasks. Yeah. Like a similar pattern shows up in mountain car problem and the windy good world. Yeah, like in, in both cases, too, this decaying signal from 1 to 0 also outperforms any of the things values you see. Well, I wanted to ask also about the thing you showed in the middle, I'm sure I understood it, where you compared uh, like doing two algorithms and then mixing the results versus, versus the. Uh, Sort of single fancy algorithms. The algorithms here, the first thing is you're running both algorithms separately and then yeah. averaging them. Yeah. So we have two trace vectors decaying at different rates, and then at the time that I'm updating one of my values, I will mix them, or I will mix like, the product between the trace vectors and the TD errors, and then 
And then it's not that you ran the two algorithms separately. The trace vector is only separately. You run the traces separately. They don't become the update. Only one update. Yeah. And one set of weights. Yeah. In the second case, like one trace vector that's decaying at some intermediate rate. That's actually kind of because of the that. So this is cheaper. It's cheaper and empirically better. It's kind of just as it is. Now what if you did run two algorithms totally separate? Two sets of weights. I guess that'd be a third algorithm. You ran them separately and then use the mixture of the weights. In that case, it's even more clear how to implement Q sigma, but in the Lambda case, there are a lot of different implementations you can take, and they all seem to work for The most important thing that we have to ask if you want to, if you want to do any acknowledgments. Um, yeah, so the original work on N step Q sigma, like, it was initially proposed by Glenna Pika, and it was first mentioned in Rich's textbook, and me, Fernando, and Zach Holland were the first to invest in Q-Sigma empirically. And we have a paper on it called Multi-Step Reinforcement Learning, a Unifying Algorithm, which goes a bit more in-depth into this end-step case of Q-Sigma. It's just a schedule in this case, so, but it can be actually state dependent. If it's however you want to set it, we don't really know if some consistent way of setting sigma dynamically. Do you have any ideas? Well, you could, you could like have some arbitrary function. Just yes. Sigma. Well, th there's that intuition because it's more biased. Than, like, it's giving more weight to bootstrapping, which is very dependent on your initial estimates. So if you had like, some measure of how confident you were in your estimates, then you could like, set sigma to take an expectation or give more weight to your rewards by sampling. Yeah. Do you try dynamic lambda? Dynamic lambda? Yeah. Um, yeah, like, after, after I realized how closely related sigma and lambda were, and how decaying sigma works, I also tried decaying lambda, and all, it also showed similar performance where it outperformed fixed values of lambda that I tried. But it was a lot more sensitive to what the gay rate actually is. Now, there's also, what about, these are all, all the results you showed are for random walk, right? But you, you have that other, can you talk about what other um, problems you've tried? You done function approximation? Right? Yeah. Well, we did those with the n step q sigma algorithm, and we did it in mountain car, which uses function approximation, and it shows similar trends to what we see in the random one, except in, except in terms of the reward instead of the RMS error. So it's control test instead of prediction test. Also, the, all the equations you gave were for the tabular case. For the tabular case? All the equations for the algorithms. Oh, like the super equations. Equations. Um, well, most of my equations ended up getting summarized. I just stated what the effective length is instead of showing all the derivations behind them. I guess, I guess you would do star set equations. Yeah. And uh, your updates. How would you generalize those equations to be function approximately? Um, 
That case, which is less efficient because it has to store the pins where you can last in um, actually state action. So it's taken. But you tap it at least again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's index paper that has the. No, I don't think so. Uh, Maybe we should add it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a key signal that that is stored directory as well, then, or not? It doesn't, but. Well, it's. It, it just needs to store three seconds and then it can be written as a sum of two errors. Mm -hmm. So when you actually implement it, you actually implement the traceway in the back, right? In QC Columbia, yes. Yeah, and what's the complexity? Um, well, the one with two trace vectors is a simple one. No, with one vector. In one vector, it's about the same as doing a true back of lambda. A true back of lambda, is that about the same? Um, as a starting lambda, except for except it has to take an expectation instead of just sampling one one value. But it's similar to uh, Q. It's similar to Q because to take the maximum, it's about the same work as taking the expectation. Okay, very good. Any more questions? Very good. Thank you. <laughs>